you might think it's just futile to argue that God doesn't exist because one can't prove a negative. Actually, there are a couple of ways to prove that a thing doesn't exist. One is to show that the thing couldn't possibly exist because the very idea of the thing literally makes no sense, like a round square. And the other way is to look very carefully and see if it's there. If you look as best you can for a thing and you still don't find it, then you can sometimes reasonably conclude that it isn't there. Both methods have been employed to show that God doesn't exist. Many have argued that God is like a round square, that some of his properties, like being all-knowing and transcending time and space, are incompatible. Because our time together is limited tonight, I will not defend any of these conceptual or incompatible property arguments against theism. I'll just point out that they do have defenders, and I invite you to look into them if you haven't done so already. Instead, I'll use the look and see method. I will defend an evidence-based case against theism. I'll argue that in light of the evidence, atheism is more reasonable to believe than theism. In particular, there is insufficient evidence for theism and overwhelming evidence for atheism. Now, I'm not suggesting that we can literally look and see whether God is there. What I have in mind can be seen in the following kind of example. Imagine that it's your birthday and your roommate has promised to bake you a birthday cake while you're away at class. So you arrive home expecting to find your roommate among mixing bowls and eggshells and a sweet smell in the air. But suppose you find none of this. Suppose what you do find is an unopened box of cake mix on a table and uh, a dozen eggs in the refrigerator. That is, you fail to find a number of things that you would expect to find had the cake been baked, and you find a number of things that you would not expect to find had the cake been baked. Well, even before looking in the oven, you could reasonably conclude, on the basis of this evidence, that your cake isn't there. And in a similar way, we can reasonably conclude that God isn't there. We do this by considering what things would be likely to find if theism were true, and what things we would be unlikely to find. I'll focus on five varieties of evidence, although there are others. First, the hiddenness of God. Second, the success of science. Third, the connection between minds and brains. Fourth, evolution. And finally, the abundance of pointless suffering. In each area, we can ask what we would expect the world to be like if there were a supernatural person who's all-knowing, all-powerful, perfectly good, who created the universe, and who seeks and deserves our love and worship. And in each area, we find that the world turns out not to be like that. First, the hiddenness of God. Let's begin by thinking a bit about why we're here. We're here for a serious discussion of whether God exists. But is this really a question about which there can be reasonable debate? After all, according to the book of Psalms, the fool hath said in his heart that there is no God. Well, if that's right, and you think that all atheists are fools, well, wait a second, don't answer that, uh, then there's no point in debating one, right? The fact that we are here suggests that there is such a thing as reasonable unbelief. But herein lies the first kind of evidence against theism. If this world were the creation of a supreme being who seeks a loving relationship with us, we would expect him to ensure that everyone believes in him, or at least everyone who's capable of reciprocating this love relationship. One would expect him to provide evidence that is sufficient to convince all such people. In fact, what we find is that there is no evidence that is persuasive to all reasonable people. Countless billions have lived and died without ever having believed in God and cannot be blamed for the lack of belief, since many deliberately and earnestly sought but could not find satisfactory reasons to believe. Notice that we're not just talking about atheists and agnostics here, but anyone who disbelieves in the God of classical monotheism, the subject of tonight's debate. Well, several of the world's oldest and most popular faiths have nothing to do with this being. Hinduism, with about 800 million adherents worldwide. Buddhism with about 350 million, or 
Chinese traditional religions, like Taoism, 225 million people. Why haven't more of these people been brought to the one true monotheistic faith by its divine author? It doesn't take much imagination to think of ways that an omnipotent being could provide evidence of ex existence that would be persuasive to all reasonable people. Suppose that at the same moment, everywhere across the globe, and in a language that was miraculously understandable by all, a booming voice called out, I am that I am. That would make me a believer. Or maybe less Hollywood. God could simply give each of us a clear, unmistakable inner awareness of his presence. Clearly, this has not happened. The philosopher J. L. Schellenberg, who pioneered this line of argument, has called the general situation divine hiddenness. The hiddenness of God is highly unlikely given theism. On the other hand, it's precisely what we would expect if there were no God at all. Second, the success of science. Related to, but distinct from divine hiddenness, there's another way that God is absent from the world, and this offers another kind of evidence that favors atheism over theism. It has to do with the natural sciences, like physics, chemistry, geology, and biology. These sciences seek to explain phenomena, like fire, earthquake, or cancer, by reference to natural causes. They do not invoke causes, like the intentions or actions of a divine person, that are thought to stand outside of nature. But nevertheless, they have been extraordinarily successful at explaining our world, enriching our understanding and enabling us to predict and control nature in accordance with our wishes. Every light you turn on, every aspirin you take is a reminder of that. The agnostic philosopher Paul Draper has pointed out recently that if theism were true, we would expect God to act in the world in ways that science must take into account. An all-powerful being who seeks a loving relationship with humanity would probably act in one way or another, directly or indirectly, as a causal agent in the history of the universe. And consequently, scientific accounts of that history would have to take his actions into account. If theism were true then, it would be extremely surprising that science can ignore God and still explain so much. And yet it does. So the success of naturalistic science, I think, favors atheism over theism. Next, the connection between minds and brains. We all have minds and mental states like thinking and feeling and perceiving. It was once widely believed that the mind must be grounded in a special immaterial substance or soul. This philosophy of mind is now known as mind-body dualism. The dualist picture of a person as a mixture between an undying spirit inside a corruptible mortal coil fits comfortably with many, though certainly not all, great religious traditions. However, the vast majority of philosophers and neuroscientists now reject dualism, and for two main reasons. First, it's not at all clear how an immaterial soul could cause changes in the physical body. Think about it. Souls are thought of as purely non-physical. They can't be weighed, split in half, heated or cooled, they lack mass, electric charge, and so on. But then how could they possibly have a cause and effect relationship with bodies which are said to have these and only these physical properties? Second, there are many highly specific correlations between mental phenomena and brain activity that we would not expect if dualism were true. For example, particular cognitive abilities such as language use and spatial reasoning are localized in particular areas of the brain. Brain injuries cause very distinctive changes to perception, cognition, even personality. Some mental diseases, like schizophrenia, have been shown to have a genetic component. But why would any of this be if the mind were entirely independent of the brain? It appears then that mind-body dualism is false with respect to us. Yet dualism is more likely given theism than given atheism. This is because theism is already committed to the existence of at least one immaterial mind, namely God, conceived of as a disembodied consciousness. Furthermore, according to the religious notion that we are made in the image of God, 
humans have an essential commonality with the divine in virtue of our everlasting souls. Atheism, by contrast, makes none of these commitments and so gives us no expectation at all that people have souls. The discovery that we have none, then, supports atheism over theism. Fourth, evolution. Our brains, no doubt, are the most complex things we've ever encountered. It's no wonder that many people look on us as masterpieces of design that provide evidence for the existence of an intelligent designer. But if we actually look at how life came about through biological evolution, we find a number of features that are extremely unexpected given theism. The evolutionary process is massively wasteful and inefficient. When people create something, we try to devise the best design in advance and then build the thing according to that design. Natural selection, the main engine driving evolution, it creates by randomly trying a huge number of possible designs and then discarding all the errors. Well, this would be like an engineer who tried to build a bridge by randomly trying every possible configuration, letting it collapse until through dumb luck, one stays standing. Well, that's not design, that's crazy. Additionally, because evolution must operate by making gradual modifications to pre-existing structures, it leaves organisms with many traits that are functionally useless or even dysfunctional. Take human beings, for example. The openings for breathing and swallowing are so close together that we often choke. They didn't have to be that way. Our appendix, apparently useless, but prone to infection, sometimes life-threatening. The birth canal is too small, increasing the chances of injury, even death during delivery. The list goes on. What's more, we know that almost every single species that has ever existed on Earth went extinct. Every museum of natural history is a junkyard of failed experiments. If we had commissioned the designer who did this, I'm afraid we'd, we'd give him the Donald Trump. You're fired. The wastefulness, inefficiency, and imperfection of biological evolution are more likely on the assumption that it is a blind causal mechanism with no mind and limited powers than on the assumption that it is the instrument, somehow, of an all-powerful, rational intelligence. It would be surprising if such a being chose to create life in such a way. Finally, the evidence from pointless suffering. Every single day, an attack against children occurs that is 10 times deadlier than the attack on the World Trade Center on September 11th. The attack comes from preventable disease, like measles, malaria, and pneumonia. According to a series of articles in the medical journal Lancet last year, malaria is a leading killer, claiming over one million children a year. It's usually fatal in young people if not treated almost immediately. The child's final experiences often include fever, shivering, severe pain in the joints, headaches, vomiting, coughing, generalized convulsions, and coma. If we say that terrorist attacks are evil because of the suffering they inflict on innocents, and surely it's right to say so, then what are we to say about this outrage? Now, we would expect an all-powerful, perfectly good God to prevent this suffering unless he has some reason not to. Notice that not just any reason will do. It will not do, for example, to say that God just doesn't care about the suffering of these children, for God is supposed to be morally perfect. No, his reason must be such that it morally justifies his failure to prevent their suffering. It's tempting to think that there is some greater good that can only come about if these thousands of children are allowed to die in pain each day, or some greater evil that would come about only if they were spared. Well, is there? We can answer that question by carefully considering all the kinds of goods and evils we can think of. For example, does humanity learn anything useful about malaria that we couldn't otherwise learn? Apparently not. We already know how to prevent it and treat it. Does it inspire you and me to be better people, to strive to save the victims? For the most part, no. But even if it did, why should they suffer 
so that we can be more virtuous. You might wonder, why should we finite beings think that we're in a position to know God's reasons? Here's the answer. If God loved us, then we would be the first to know the reasons he permits bad things to happen to us. A loving father who must bring his child to the hospital for a painful medical treatment will explain to her the reasons why he does what he does. If she can't understand the reasons, he'll at least make sure that she feels his presence and comfort and receives some assurance that there is a reason, even though she can't see it right now. So there is every reason to think that we especially should be aware of any justifying reasons that God has. What we in fact find is that many of those who undergo terrible anguish, such as Holocaust survivors, report feeling totally abandoned by God in their time of need. Of course, many victims of disease, starvation, and natural disaster die very young, having never even believed in him. So, if after considering the matter carefully, we are unaware of any kind of state of affairs that would justify God in permitting suffering of this kind, we can reasonably conclude that there is no such state of affairs. But it follows that there is no perfectly good God. If God were here with us, then something must justify the suffering of these millions of children. But ask yourself, can you really believe that? Can you really believe it is anything other than a tragic, pointless disaster? To conclude, have we proven a negative? Well, the word prove is tricky. Sometimes proving means offering reasons that establish a claim with certainty beyond any possibility of doubt or error. It would be nice if all questions could be resolved with this degree of certainty. But in fact, almost nothing we can know, including our scientific knowledge, can be proved in this sense, except in logic and mathematics, perhaps. What we can do, and what I have tried to do, is to indicate a body of evidence that when taken as a whole, makes atheism significantly more reasonable to believe than theism. The hiddenness of God, the success of the naturalistic sciences, the physical embodiment of minds, the carelessness of the evolutionary process, and the abundance of pointless suffering and the lack of God's comfort in the face of it all make atheism more probable than theism. The world would not be this way if theism were true. The world would not be this way if God existed.